All right. Jonathan Jacotti, the man, the myth, the legend, in the studio. How are you doing? Doing great. Happy to be here. I'm excited. Thanks for joining us over a bottle of some unfiltered, delicious Prosecco. Yeah. Um, where is this from? Where is this, uh, this, this delicious? Is, so this is, oh, well, I mean, it's from Bar Chicotti. Yeah. Like, you guys picked it up. But, yep. Uh, like, where, uh, so the producer or the purveyor who we get it from, Owen Coulter, uh, Drink Owen Wines, is uh, pretty much all, like, natural wines and um, made, you know, from organic vineyards or uh, source, you know, from all over, really um different spots but it's all like small production yep. wineries and so we uh we use a lot of his wines at bar Chicotti, but we yeah. have a, a mixed spread you know? and you were talking earlier yeah. about like once you've built a trust and a relationship with a sp- specific importer yeah um you know it's going to be good wine you know it's going to be locally yeah. sourced you know like how do you build those relationships how do you meet these people just wine tasting yeah. and you know you usually just like meet up and they're like, here's what I got. And like, they'll op- usually open up like five or six bottles, kind of average. Yep. Sometimes they'll have more or less than that. And uh, they just kind of start telling you like the stories behind the different winemakers and the regions and where it comes from. And so then all of a sudden you're tasting it, and then you have this more of a connection mm-hmm. to the wine. And then, you know, we're always like building all these notes, like the ones that we like, take notes. And then, you know, get prices and all that stuff and then, you know, feed it to the team and uh, feed the team. You know, <laughs> I love it. Yeah. So then they start educating the guests and, you know, all these uh, fun little stories behind wine and food, you know, are really the important, important thing behind it and the exciting part of it. You know? yeah. yeah. That's one thing that, that I've noticed every time I've gone into either one of your establishments. So we've got Story of Kachina yeah. and we've got Bar Chikati. Every single time I feel like, you know, even when like I'm talking with you, 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 you know, you say, this is the one I'd recommend with try it with this. You, you have all these recommendations from your experience, but yeah. I get the same, you know, the vibe from each one of the servers or the bartenders or the people working there because you take the time to educate people. Definitely. And that's huge. Yeah. That experience is awesome. Yeah. Everyone that's like coming through the doors, like whether you're a, a server, a dishwasher, a prep cook. Um, whatever it's you know when you're working at like story kachina bar chigotti a lot of it is like education you know you're gonna leave there like being part of the family part of the team but also like you're gonna learn a lot and like whenever you do leave you know you're gonna you know have all this knowledge that you leave with which is su- super important to me to like always you know pass that down um you know to the younger generation of cooks and restaurant teams so that way you know you keep it alive in the industry yeah. And yeah. we're, we're all talking about it. And I think pretty much every experience that I've had, uh, at, let's say at story of Kachina, yeah. um, I, I feel like I'm not in a rush, which is nice. Sometimes you go into a restaurant people are like, they're like, Hey, what do you want? Let's get it going. And I never felt like I'm in a rush, which is, yeah. is that kind of the vibe that you're going for? People can kind of come to stay and definitely play like, and eat. And, yeah, yeah. I think that's like also like the Italian way too. like, you know, you're taking your time, you, you know, you're starting um, you know, aperitivo, moving on to, you know, little snacks, then some pasta, then maybe you get a pizza and, you know, you're getting some Prosecco and you're moving on to, you know, maybe a cocktail or whatever. So yeah, you want, we want the guest experience definitely not to be rushed. And we want the servers and the team to like get to know the guests and, um, have more of like a personal connection, like be yourself, like just chat with them. Don't put on like a, a fake face, right. you know, like it's a, especially like when it's a small town, you know, like you want to get to know everyone and get yep. to know your regulars and their likes and recommend different stuff to them, you know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to take a little turn here because yeah, before being an entrepreneur, you have a love for food and wine and the gathering, right? That's kind of like the core of what a restaurant is. Oh, and, yeah. So let's talk about your ideal restaurant experience for you. Say, say you're behind the counter. I mean, you're, you're, you're cooking up a meal for friends and family. What, what music is on? What, what flavors are you going with? What's your meal? What's like, what, what is, what is your direction that you're going? Oh man. Uh, yeah. All that stuff is so important. Like, you know, um, I think I'm very, uh, seasonal driven, um, you know, 
with and with just like moods and seasons like it all kind of comes together with food and um yeah there's always uh music you know it's so important yeah uh, uh off the top of my head what's your uh, what's your go-to song <laughs> to get in the zone to say i'm gonna i'm gonna make some some meatballs or just a classic dish what's like what inspires you um I mean, honestly, like putting on like some Dean Martin. Yeah. You know, like, love it. Definitely. If you're like cooking Italian food, like we play uh, a lot of Dean Martin at Story Cucina. Yep. Uh, Louis Prima. Yep. Um, all those like Italian cl- classics, Frank Sinatra. Um, definitely if you're making pasta or something, some yeah. of that stuff. But then, you know, I like um, like Fleetwood Mac or yep. Beatles or, um, you know, classic reggae stuff bob marley i don't know you know just go all over the map yep you know yeah but there it seems like with e- within each genre there is like a there is a core that is good for cooking it like yeah. no matter what you can you can probably oh, yeah, some good have... rap or hip-hop it's like that'll oh, get you definitely. going some reggae yeah some classic yeah <laughs> love it so f- like right now let's say seasonally like what what would be your go-to meal you have friends coming over you're like okay i'm gonna grab a bottle of wine or yeah. five bottles or whatever it is yeah. What are, what are you cooking? Honestly, like right now, you know, we're we're in fall. It's cold. It's rainy. Moving into like braises. So um, going to do like if I'm making like an Italian dish, I'm probably going to do like a, a, a sugo, you know, like um, braise, like some lamb shanks and, Ooh. you know, all right, just like low and slow and then do like a nice sugo out of that and um and then whatever type of pasta you want to do, like the shapes are endless. They're endless, know? yeah. Cavatelli, um, rigatoni, like, um, yeah. So the many. list goes on and yeah. on. Love it. So, so I mean, so you, you talked about being seasonal, and that's yeah. that's big for you. Um, I think a lot of restaurants, from what I've noticed, either maybe they adjust seasonally a little bit, yeah. but they're mostly just like core, we're going to keep doing the same thing. And you're like, no, every season is different. Yeah. Every wine pairing is oh, different. Yeah. Every music, like all of it is constantly moving. Yeah. Evolving. It's always, it's always changing. And, um, you know, you're in moods for different things, you know, it's like raining out. You want like a Brodo, you know, yeah. like one of my favorite dishes, tortellini and Brodo, um, from Northern Italy. Um, a lot of my Italian side of the family is from Cento, which is like okay. just a little bit North of Bologna. Okay. Every time I go there, like one of the first meals they always make me is like tortellini and brodo and it's awesome yeah uh, it's so good and what and i know i know tortellini and yeah. what what's what's brodo brodo is broth yeah in italian oh so, it's in broth yeah so it's just in broth. so you like think of like a cold kind of foggy night or rainy night and you're just like eating this pasta like nice broth a yep. little bit of parmigiano on top it's like one of the most like simple pastas um takes a lot a lot of work to make it because they're so <laughs> tiny yeah and each one of them is like handmade like stuffed um but it's like a i like you know throwing like little dinner parties yeah where we'll be like all right we're gonna make tortellini and like teach all my friends how to make tortellini and we'll we'll all get in there we'll start making it and then we got all this tortellini and then we cook it off put it in the broth and then you know it's like a simple pasta dinner you know that gets everyone interacting yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a lifestyle. And I mean, it sounds like so much of your upbringing and your family life had to do with this gathering and like in cooking and tell me a little yeah. bit more about what, what inspired you early on to say, well, I mean, eating food is awesome. I love yeah. eating food. What inspired you to say, I want to create for other people. Honestly, um, my mom and dad were both like into growing gardens and eating you know they're just both like super naturalist yeah um growing everything sourcing good ingredients and i didn't really know any better like when i was a kid i was just like this is what we had like we're always eating meals like fully out of the garden we always had chickens and getting fresh eggs and i'm just spoiled with all this product and i think that's kind in high school like got me inspired to cook a little more like you know just having having all this good product um accessible right there then on lopez island too like i would i always tell everyone like i'll do a you know to go back home and like do these different farm dinners on lopez 
and the product that I'm getting on Lopez Island, like, and I've cooked all over the place, all these different chefs and Michelin starred restaurants and stuff, but go back home, Lopez Island's like the best product I'll ever get, you know? Why, and you show that it? to like, yeah. it's just like, you know, it's, you know, the small farms are right yeah. there. You know, it's the connection with the farmers. Um, uh, it's the, you know, uh, all the, the hard work that, into raising the animals or growing the produce or um milling local grains like you know it's just the the level of quality it's smaller scale and yeah. it's the relationships yeah. yeah and and for you early on uh um, you had this environment right yeah and then so w what happened after like your like early childhood where you have this you know delicious stock of good produce and all of this and the next step is okay I mean, did you start cooking for your family? Well, yeah. I mean, what was I mean, the, what was like, the next step? Um, yeah, I would, I would cook like dinners, like for my family and stuff, like in high school and get books and reading. And, um, of course, like, you know, my, uh, my mother's side, the Italian side, like we're always like, you know, cooking different Italian dishes, like that are passed down, uh, through our Italian side and, uh, my grandpa, Mario Ciccotti, he made it to Story Cucina and Bar Chicotti. Love he's it. 83. Uh, he's taught me a lot of recipes growing up. And he gave you a good review, by the way, didn't he? Oh, yeah. He said, you're, you're good. <laughs> <laughs> Signed off. <laughs> yeah. He's always like saying different stuff on Facebook. I was like, you know, surprised he can even use it. But yeah. Hey, you know. kudos to him. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Uh, but yeah, then after that, I was like, okay, I'm like ready to. Um, explore this career a little more. And, um, I, you know, I was always like interested in business as well. Like my grandpa, um, always owned his own businesses. And I think that's just like a, an Italian thing yeah. to do, you know? Yeah. And, um, yeah. Then I went to culinary school and, um, started learning a little bit more. And, um, then after that, you know, kind of fell in love with these kitchens and, uh the hard work and the discipline in there but yep. it was like very rewarding just to be a part of that team and community um you know and, and i like that you know so everything from like getting a good base education you know one of the things that i've noticed is there's a lot of really good restaurants that are owned by people that didn't start off as a necessarily like an educated chef i mean they yeah. started out as a business owner and kind of worked that learned their way from there but you started yeah. with this education this this kind of family base yeah then education and how important was that that formal education going into these these kitchens where you're you're the newbie in the kitchen yeah. and yeah. they're like you're doing this and you're like uh, okay oh yeah yeah like, tell it, me about a day in the uh, life like early oh, on yeah. Yeah, it was brutal, honestly. Like, I used to get my ass kicked all the time. Um, so, yeah, one of the first, so one of the first chefs I worked for, Christian Olivier, old school French chef. And, you know, I walked into his kitchen. It was just uh, opening this restaurant called Lagaloo. And I, I had no idea what I was walking into. You know, yeah. I was like, yeah, I want to learn. You know, I'm in culinary school. Yeah. Like, okay. Uh, so basically, I started off as, as prep and i'm literally like peeling like all these potatoes and onions like for like french onion soup and yep. stuff like eyes just like destroyed destroyed <laughs> <laughs> yeah so um yeah and then i mean kitchens have changed a bit since then but i mean there was like a lot of you know yelling and screaming and uh, yeah. a lot of discipline like you had to just like shape up and you a little know, bit like military school, of, huh? Pretty much. Yeah. 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 There's a lot of, a lot of pressure in those kitchens to get everything perfect. So I know this is kind of a cliche in the yeah. restaurant world, but like, it's kind of like, what is it? Hell's kitchen with the uh, Ramsey. Kind, kind of. Yeah. A little yeah. bit, not, not yeah. too far off base. Yeah. Not too far off. Yeah. 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 But I mean, but part of that, I mean, it's great to yeah. have things nice and easy, but it also is like, how important was the no, kind of yeah, tough, exactly. you know, I think, uh, you know, there, it, it, obviously doesn't need to be that extreme anymore. Like things have changed a lot, but um, just, you know, dedicating yourself and the time to the craft and, you know, realizing that, yeah, all these little things matter. And, you know, um, you know, we can't just like, be like, Oh, like this is, you know, burnt a little bit. It's going to be okay. It'll do. It'll you do. Know, you yeah. kind of get that discipline 
of you know there's when you're when you're in a kitchen there's so many moving parts mm -hmm. and you have to be like the master at multitasking you know you have like ovens and pots and stocks and grills and you know timing with you know other things and it's just like this whole dance in the kitchen that is uh you know it takes a while when you're first starting out to like really understand all those little details you're just a beat so, off maybe one direction and it's driving other people up a wall but you're just trying to learn and, yeah yeah exactly so uh, it's important to to take the time and uh teach the young cooks all these proper techniques and keep them around yep absolutely yeah. so how do you as a leader going through this like kitchen boot camp essentially yeah and, and and kind of you understand that the new the new way that it's done it yeah. doesn't have to be that intense yeah how do you how do you kind of filter those lessons that you learned in that kitchen and then say well this, this is the same lesson but i don't need to scream it at you yeah. like, you know how do you how do you do that well i mean part of the the way i set up story cucina too is just like the way the the food movement is moving where it's like a little bit more casual too is um everything is like a, a little bit more simple yeah you know but that's italian food too yeah you know um it's all just like based off simplicity you know it's not overly complicated and story cucina is like literally like pizza pasta cocktails yeah there's no reservations it's walking only um but all the ingredients that we're sourcing are you know the best ingredients that you can get from the surrounding area so that's like for me is like you know the integrity of what we're doing uh, is still there even though it's not you know something really high end you know it's it's done right but it's simple good food um so anyway you know, right right there it's a little easier on the cooks but uh, honestly just taking the time to like be there with them and talk to them and like show them you know and like explain to them like why we do something you know and get them excited about it yeah you know why is important yeah yeah Definitely. Well, it's interesting because I've, you know, doing some research in, 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 in your previous uh, in venture down in, in San Francisco, yeah. it's a different crowd, right? Yeah. And when, you know, starting to get to know your business model up here a little bit better, I'm like, man, yeah, he totally gets Bellingham. Like simple. Oh, yeah. It doesn't need to be, it's super, it is nice, yeah. but it doesn't need to be overly fancy and stuffy. Yeah. yeah. And so how did you, how did you gauge that? I mean, you're from the P, the PNW, the Pacific yeah. Northwest. So you knew the vibe a little yeah, bit. Yeah, because I grew up here yeah. and, you know, I'd come back all the time. And honestly, before I opened Storia, um, I, I would be bouncing back and forth and doing like a lot of research too, just like eating around. But, you know, I, you know, it seemed like, like a lot of the restaurants were like pretty busy here, but um, there was just, there was room for the style of restaurant, you yeah. know, it was like room for growth. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't, uh, yeah. <laughs> you just, you just kind of, I mean, well, it's, and it's a rough job to have to go eat at a bunch of places, right? You're like, yeah. oh, I'm going to try this. I'm going to try this. But so you, I mean, you just, it's simple. I mean, you just, you just yeah. knew, you knew your demographic, you knew what you're looking for. Yeah. And it sounds like you knew what you wanted. Yeah. I wanted something like, yeah, simple. Like, so my restaurant in San Francisco, um, you know, I co owned it with a chef friend of mine. Mm -hmm. And we actually, you know, we we're Italian buddies, uh, knew each other since culinary school, actually. And that was, you know, when I first opened Hillside, mm -hmm. uh, it was my first restaurant. And, you know, I was in my mid 20s at the time, so, you know, just so excited, but still like learning a lot. Mm -hmm. And I was literally there pretty much every day for like the seven years that it was open. Yep. And for me at this point in my career, I wanted to to grow and have a, a little bit larger restaurant, but simpler and easy where I don't have to actually be there every minute to make sure every you know thing is running good or like more complicated recipes that are um, harder to train cooks and stuff. So the whole setup of Story Cucina is like, how can I do what I love still and like set it up simple um, where I can train up the team to operate it and have a chef de cuisine and have a manager. And so, I mean, it's, it's almost taking like, cause it's all art. Yeah. And it's like taking this like amazingly fine tuned art and still having it be amazing and fine tuned, but also just like so much simpler and, I mean, how complicated, if you had like a 
you know, pasta with meatballs. Yeah. How complicated can that get? I mean, can, it could be as simple or yeah. as, like as complicated as possible. Well, yeah. Well, actually, like meatballs are a lot of work to make. Like, yeah, to make good proper meatballs. Um, uh, you know, sourcing the good ingredients, but then you know, um, there's a lot that goes into them, like mixing them. Then you got to roll them up. Then you got to, you know, just rolling each one takes a lot of time. You have to roast them in the oven at least the way we do then we braise them in the tomato sauce so you're gonna make the tomato sauce from scratch oh yeah they're you know braising the tomato sauce low and slow till they're just like nice and soft and so yeah just for like something simple as a meatball a lot of a lot of work goes into it still but um and that and that clip will be played on the late night hour for those foodies (laughs) out there that uh want to hear a little uh little food uh food fun there um but yeah i mean it's so it's it just blows my mind that there's all of these levels of complexity but it's yeah. but it's the same ex- like for me it's a it's a great experience coming in because i can tell that it there's thought and love yeah. and care that goes yeah, all into the it. little attention yeah. to details yeah so let's talk a little bit more about like being an artist like there you got to have a little bit of ego to like you have to have the confidence side of ego mm-hmm. and then the other side of it is like at what point is it do you are you able to pass it off to somebody else because scaling a business you have to leverage and you have yeah. to you know, figure out a way to do exactly yeah. what you just talked about yeah. accomplishing. I think that was like something, uh, you know, I've learned, learned over the years, like owning a restaurant is, you know, one of the hardest things is like letting go, Yeah. you know? And I think I, um, you know, getting better at that, you takes know, time, like, man. yeah, it takes yeah. a lot, a lot of time to like trust someone else, like with your food and your dishes. And, you know, cause at the end of the day, when people are coming into your restaurant, like it's representing yourself and, being a chef and um so you know if anything goes wrong or like one of one of the cooks does something wrong or your chef or something you know it like reflects on you so um it is hard to let go yeah but it's it's important to to you know have trust in your team and um give them that sense of responsibility which gets them excited like you know i i've noticed a lot of times like I'm like, oh man, I can't leave. I can't leave. But then like the minute I leave, like all of a sudden everyone just uh, knows like, oh, the w- like it's on our shoulders now. Like, you know, yeah. like chef isn't here to like, you know, uh, and they just take do care it. of it all. Yeah. Yeah. And they like feel good about it, you know? So. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a balance for yeah. sure. Um, I'm curious because I, I know my experience, which has been amazing every time. Yeah. When you're designing this place, tell me a little bit more about like pre, you know, opening. Yeah. How long was this a was this a you know a business baby in your mind? How how long were you were you brewing on this before it became a, a reality? Honestly, like a couple of years before it opened. So um, it all you know it all started like when I was in San Francisco, and I reached the point where I'm like, this this isn't it for me. Like. I'm here for a long time, but I'm like, I'm ready for the next, like, what's the next like five year plan for me. And San Francisco just wasn't that place for me anymore. And you know, I was missing my family. My, you know, my sister was having kids. She had, you know, my, my little niece yep. whose picture is on the wall. Yep. Like she was like a big reason. I, I you know, I want to be like a part of part of her life and like see her growing up. I don't want to be like a distant uncle you know, just yep. over FaceTime all the time and come back once or twice a year. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of things kind of like pulling me in this direction. And then, so I was like, okay, well, if I'm going to like restart my life, you know, somewhere else after I've been like so established in this city, um, obviously I have to open another restaurant, yep. you know, cause that's what I do. Yeah. And so that was, you know, so I started brainstorming and doing, trips to Bellingham and, um, you know, uh, one of, yeah, you know, one of my dreams was always to open an Italian restaurant, yep. you know, my restaurant in San Francisco was like a California seasonal California neighborhood spot. And yep. I'm sure there's like Italian influence on it. Um, but not like a proper Italian restaurant, yep. you know, what, it, what, what is a, what are the requirements of a, and I know they're not spoken yeah. on a wall or what I mean, but there's, it's it's a thing. There's a yeah. there is a classic, proper Italian restaurant. What are yeah. like what are what are your your requirements for that? 
You have to have meatballs on the menu. <laughs> <laughs> are there play, are there Italian restaurants that don't have meatballs on the menu? I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's number one. Yeah. What, I mean, what else? Um, I mean, if like you have to have like the Negroni is like like the classic yeah. Italian cocktail. Um, you know, you have to have a you know decent selection of Italian wines. Um, and then, you know, you have to definitely have to have pasta, yeah. you know, and it's got to be handmade, like, you know, Yep. Um, but I think, you know, from there, you know, things can vary. There's diff- a lot of different types of Italian restaurants and people doing different things, yep. you know, but that's like the classic, the quintessential, yeah, you need like yeah. people expect that, you know, and, um, I think, uh, you know, tiramisu dessert like, yep. oh, yeah. is also like people expect that you have to have tiramisu. Uh, um, so stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. So when you're in this process of your wheels are turning, you're like, yeah. I want to be back home. Yeah. Uh, do you have a pre-launch team? Do you have like people that you're talking to up here that are helping you yeah. boots on the ground? What was that like? Yeah. So, um, so Arlen, Arlen Coyley, my chef mm-hmm. de cuisine, um, who's, you know, he, he's amazing. He's been at the restaurant um, every day since day one, since the build out, been a part of it. So um, I brought him on as chef de cuisine and also gave him uh, some partnerships, some sweat equity yep. in the restaurant. And, you know, which was, it was just like a good mutual uh, benefit because, you know, I was able to like train him up on all my recipes and, he gets to be like a part of this restaurant and like what I was talking about, the education part yep. before, like kind of take him under my wing and, you know, show him like, Hey, this is how, how you open a restaurant. Like, yeah. These are all the little details that go into it. And this is how a kitchen is, you know, ran properly. And I'm going to, you know, show you all these little steps, you know, and, you know, he's worked in different kitchens before and he actually came down and worked for me in SF for a little bit. Yep. He's also from Lopez. And you guys knew each other growing up or Yeah, so he's he's younger than me. Um so he's kind of, you know, I've 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 watched him grow up, yeah. you know. And when uh, it was like the career counselor in Lopez school, which is like 250 kids yep. K through 12, yep. super small, kind of reached out to me once and was like, "Hey, these few kids are like interested in culinary like would you mind coming by and like chatting with them so i like came to the school this was when arlen was in high school and i brought like some books and knives and i'm just like chatting with them about the career and you know how it's you know it's a tough career and you're working on like holidays and weekends when everyone else is off like playing and having fun and you know it's a different lifestyle yep. and, fast pace and it's not the normal nine to five and um and then you know talked about food and everything and so yeah like me and him um always had like a a good connection and so you know there's not like a lot of people that i would want to just trust and like bring in you know to something like this but um yeah arlen went to western and uh been very well connected in bellingham and uh has helped me a ton in the the process of getting settled in Bellingham and um, which restaurants to try and what's going on here in the food scene and connecting me with the local farmers and stuff. Yeah. 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 That's awesome. Yeah. And so you guys have known each other for a long time. And yeah. so you're, you're building up it's, it's you two and, and you know, you have other connections that you're building up here with farmers and yeah. So, um, I mean, I mean the restaurant literally started off with, you know, first me having this idea to come back and then business plan. Yep. I started writing out a business plan, you know, everything of, you know, what the restaurant would, you know, look like, smell like, sound like, you know, you start just yeah. writing all these little details and what kind of dishes you want to serve. And then from there, you know, you try to find the right space and, you know, you're hunting, hunting down, you know, what's available and looking at leases and yeah. prices and, um, crunching the numbers and all that stuff and how much is it going to cost to yep. do the build out and uh, where's the money going to come from and so all valid a, questions. Yeah, yeah there's yeah. a lot that goes on and um, you know so like me opening in the pandemic it was like okay I put in a lot of work 
to get to the restaurant, you know, sign the lease, the build out, all the stuff to where it was all done and it was just about to open. And then the pandemic hit literally like a couple of days before my grand opening party was going to be. So that's when everything just stopped. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's like some people like still say like, well, like, you're crazy. Like, why did you open a restaurant in the pandemic? I'm like, I had no choice. Yeah. <laughs> like, you're like, confidentially, I, I am crazy. <laughs> yeah. like, I didn't feel like just like open it up. Like a lot of work goes into opening a restaurant before it actually opens. You know, it's interesting that you say that because yeah. most people who don't understand what it takes to run your own business, yeah, which there's nothing wrong with that, but yeah. it's just a lack of education on what it takes. And yeah. I think sometimes it is seen as this like, you're just way out there. You're crazy. You're jumping into traffic head on all, but, but realistically it's a belief yeah. in your own abilities. Right. And that moment you're like building up to doing this, then this hits and it's probably like, you know, kicking the shorts and you're like, I still believe in what we're creating. So what, what was that moment like for you to go? Yeah, okay. Pandemic. Okay. This sucks. This is crazy. I don't know what this means, but we're still going to do this. Yeah. Yeah. What was that like? Uh, it was, it was a tough, it was a tough time. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, when the, when the pandemic first hit, I still had my restaurant going in San Francisco. Um, I was also consulting for two restaurants in the Bay area as well. And then I was trying to launch Storia and my goal was to like launch Storia, get it going and then kind of bounce back and forth. And then once, you know, I was like, okay, Storia is, you know, doing well, well enough. Then I can like cut all my ties in San Francisco and move here permanently. Yep. But when everything just shut, I was like, okay, shut my restaurant in San Francisco. Story didn't open, stopped my consulting job, had no source of income, didn't know <laughs> what was going to happen next. Had just like, you know, invested all this time and money into the new project. And I'm just like, you know, I was freaking out a little bit. Which you know? it, it's so interesting because so much of what you just described on that business yeah. plan, which I'd love to hear what, like you talked about what the restaurant sounds like and smells like. Yeah. Run me through that. Like I'm yeah. for the first time, yeah. which the first time I had food from Storia yeah. was actually delivery because you guys, we couldn't physically go there. Yeah. So that was my first experience, yeah. which was great, but there's so much of this relationship that's built yeah. by this list of yeah. things you went through in your business. Like what is, what does that person experience? What yeah. was the, what was the projection? Well, yeah, like I was, so I was nervous about opening with to go food, obviously. Yeah. You know? And so I put like a lot of work into like the packaging and branding and uh, doing a lot of test runs. Like, all right, this is going to be the first time uh, people try my food at this new restaurant and it's to go, which is like, for a chef, it's like the worst thing ever. Like yeah. to go food is like, oh, okay, it's to go food. You yeah. know, it's not gonna be nearly as good. You want people to like experience, you know, all the music and all the sounds and uh, you know, just the, the liveliness of the restaurant and be tasting it fresh out of the oven. Um, you know, uh it just so obviously I was nervous about that, but still try to put together like a solid to go packaging yep. and all that kind of stuff. So it actually hold up well and keep the food hot and still look nice, nice presentation. So, was, you know, and at the time it was like the only thing that was available. Um, so I think, you know, we did a good job and taking our time before launching to make sure all that stuff was dialed before just like, Oh, we got to open the door. It's like, no, we got to like kind of rethink this and launch this way. But um, yeah, but in the business plan, like talking about, you know, all those little details, you know, are, are so important. And it, it comes down to like, you know, I had a good architect friend of mine that helped me with the design layout uh, of the restaurant. And, you know, we're like going out to eat all the time and, you know, the lighting's got to be just right. When you walk into the door, um, you know, like, what are you going to see and how's it going to feel? And sort of like thinking about all that stuff as you know could we have this blank canvas the space before the whole build out so there's like all these you know different layouts and the one we we chose with you know we have the skylight above yep. that's like right over the kitchen which is like the center so cool. piece yeah if you walk in the door you can see like the pizza oven the glowing in the kitchen because it's all open so like all that stuff was was planned out so like when you're in the restaurant and you you like feel so good 
and the lighting is just right and yep. all those little details you know the bar is here you're hearing the cocktails getting shaken the the pans the move you know the laughter like all that stuff was you know kind of planned out yeah in a way you know a lot of little you don't always notice it but you're like why am i just so comfortable and like I want to order another Negroni right now. Yeah. I don't want to leave. I know, know? the feeling. It's yeah. Like, <laughs> it's like all those little details are so important. Yeah. Know? Date night always yeah. escalates in a good way when we go there. It's yeah. like, we're like, yeah, let's just have a couple drinks. Next yeah. thing you know, like the waitress or waiter is like, you got you have to try this one. And we're like, okay, cool. And we're Ubering yeah. home. So it's, it's, yeah, it's always a good yeah. time. I, I totally see what your vision yeah. is. Um, and how does that, I mean, does that come from experiencing what little things or little details or bigger things you didn't like about other restaurants and that's not to like bash yeah. on any other restaurants no. but just like your I, personal taste yeah i think it comes like from over time like you know i obviously love like traveling and eating and you know having different dining experiences and then um you know owning my own restaurant previously in san francisco and like you know seeing all these details on a day-to-day -day thing you just like you you'll just like walk into any kind of restaurant you just can't turn it off you just like you just notice all these constantly things. analyzing yeah yeah and like you know you're getting inspiration and you know i'm always like taking notes of stuff i like or um you know likes or dislikes you know like yep. every inch it's crazy yeah. yeah so okay so you get to this point you're like oh crap i have to build a relationship without the experience that i envisioned yeah and you know you worked on the food the packaging all of the pieces that you could yeah. possibly control so you're focusing on the this you know percentage of what you could actually control yeah and as an entrepreneur that's probably something that happens more than we'd like to think we're like ah, this is what i can control yeah how did like it's a big part of your business that you could not control what was that experience like for you processing like that honestly um I was just kind of like taking it day by day at that point. I was like, okay, well, we're not going to, this isn't like the normal restaurant opening where we're going to have like a whole team and like, you know, do all this training. It was like, literally I was like, okay, like I'm work, I'm going to be working the line. Um, and it was basically me, Arlen, and then one person in the front of the house yep. and it was the three of us like opening up. I was like, okay, that's, that's it. Like that's all we need for to go food. And, um, I guess like with social media, people posting on yep. social media, like their experience, like that was like the closest I got to walking up to a table and, you know, asking yeah. them how everything was or getting to see them in the dining room. I'd see these posts on social media and, you know, everyone was at home in the pandemic, spending a little bit more time than maybe normal on social media. So yeah. that kind of helped spread, spread the word. I think, um, you know, I was like, Oh, what else are we going to do on a Friday night? I guess we get to get takeout. You yeah. know? So all of a sudden we'd get like on Friday, we'd get this like Friday rush of takeout food. <laughs> yeah. It was so weird. And the restaurant completely empty. So that part was like a little depressing. Yeah. You know, cause you're just like, you have this brand new spot. You want to celebrate it and share yeah. it with everyone. But everyone would get to like walk in the door, like right in the beginning of the restaurant. We had like a table lined off yep. and that's where they'd pick up their food. So they get to like, we always had like the good music playing still. Yep. And the lights. I remember. Nice. Yeah. I came in. Yeah. Yeah. So like people would come in and get to see, oh my God, like I can't wait till we can dine here one day, yep. you know? So it was kind of a slow process, but it was also, um, there's a lot of, things that benefit from opening up that way. Like, you know, I got to work directly uh, with my chef Arlen and train him up like every day on all the extra little restaurants time to do it, yeah. and all the little details. And then we slowly got to grow, like hire a couple people and then a couple more people, you know, and train them up. And instead of normally, like when you open a restaurant, it's like you have this, you know, huge team, you're trained up all at once everyone just like bombarding the door as you get this three months of like craziness. Yep. Um, and now it's like, all right, we really get to take care of every little person. Cause we're only doing this much business. Yeah. So know? it's kind of a blessing in disguise. I mean, it's yeah, obviously hard, but yeah. that piece, right? Yeah. 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 That part, there's like, so, 
you know, so much benefited from it. We were able to like really take care of everyone, and slowly build them up and like get all these regulars kind of. Yeah. It's like, an, it's just intentional growth, right? Yeah. Um, unintentional circumstantial growth, right? Yeah. It's funny. You're talking about takeout. My wife, uh, she, same way she wants to be at the restaurant i i, I some days we're just lazy and we need to oh, sit yeah. on the couch and whatever but yeah. i love it and i'm sure when she listens to this she's gonna love to hear that that yeah. there's there's other people out there that are fighting to just always have people in the in the <laughs> restaurant i love it yeah so okay so intentional growth it, you start building and you know you've run other businesses and you've seen other people run their businesses yeah. and what were those moments how did you like what you're, you're kind of having to live on the edge a little bit with without knowing what the future holds yeah with business with the world the economy all these yeah. things um how did you make decisions that probably were more risky in that's in that sort of environment on hey we need to hire someone this is time to leverage yeah yeah um just like i think um just like keeping like a close look on like the numbers and the business we're doing and you could see like the slow slowly growing like even if it was just to go food you know um you know we we're growing uh, you know getting busy enough where i was like oh man now we now we need a prep cook or a dishwasher uh, it like makes sense yep. you know at that point because we're doing more business um and then you know once we you know had outdoor seating then we're like sitting people outside so now now we need like a server you yep. know so um yeah, it was just like these little steps that made sense, you know, or uh, we're doing to-go cocktails, so now we need a bartender, yep. you know. So, um, yeah, I was just keeping a, a close look on all the numbers, yep. um, which is, you know. Yeah, so it's interesting because some people are more reactive and some people are more proactive. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like the key was being very in touch with your business and the people oh, and the yeah. numbers and understanding that made it just an educated guest, you know, for, yeah. for the most part, a guesstimate, right? Of like, you know what, this could go wrong, but we'll be okay if it does. Yeah. Is that kind of the question you were, or the, the statement that you're throwing out a lot? Yeah, a little, a little bit, but it was also, I think, uh, like knowing that I was like, okay, if we're going to make it work no matter what, you know, like for me, like, um, like closing down and failing or, whatever like was an option i was like we're gonna you know make it through this you know yeah yeah and and you hear a lot of people talk about well you know if this doesn't work out I'll just do something else and yeah. i love hearing that because you know a lot of people we're in a world with a lot of options actually yeah. right yeah how do you if you even though you do have options how do you like convince yourself there is no other route this is it how do you, yeah. how do you, is it self-talk? What's like, what's the Jonathan self-talk? Like, you know, honestly, after running a business in San Francisco, it was a really tough city. Um, everything is so expensive, um, very competitive. Um, it's hard, you know, it's hard to find good people because a lot of people can't afford to live there yep. that are on restaurant salaries. So they've kind of moved out. And so in a way that prepared me for the pandemic a little bit, so, you know, yeah. cause I was like, all right, we got to do whatever it takes to survive. And a lot of that is just like chef mentality, like goes back to like when I was working at Christian Deluve, just, yeah. you know, that, um, dedication and passion for the food. Like, well, well, we just got to make it happen. Yeah. You know? Love yeah. it. So you, you get through, you know, the first bit of time doing takeout. Yeah. I know it's a bad word right now, takeout, but it's a good word too. Yeah. Um, so you get to this point where people actually can come in and dine in the outdoor seating. So the city yeah. of Bellingham then said, I think it was on Holly and on Grand and yeah. probably a few other locations where you're able the to. Roads. Yeah. And did you jump on that immediately and say, oh man, we're, we're building this. ASAP. Oh yeah. yeah. And I think like the, the Bellingham community itself, like everyone was very supportive through the challenging time like um everyone was like offering help or what they could do like the city like worked with us you know was making it a lot easier than normal like sometimes the city as we all know can be challenging yeah. at yeah. times but yeah. like during this time they're like yep like make it happen like here's what you got to do and like the downtown partnership 
yep. you know, they were going They're around awesome. like, yeah. being super helpful. Our neighbors, uh, Jenny and James from the cider house right yep. next door, like, you know, they had opened their business before me and like, they were being super helpful. So just the amount of people that were there and like, like, Oh my God, like you're opening brand new and this, like, what can we do to help? And, um, it was really amazing. It like brought me back to growing up on Lopez mm-hmm. where the, like the community just like jumps in when wins needed and like everyone's helping each other out, you know? Was that, was that kind of a, a flip of the coin from, from your experience in San Francisco? You said it was pretty, pretty com- competitive and cutthroat. Yeah, I was, um, you know, uh, I would say like where my restaurant was in Bernal Heights, so it had more of a neighborhood feel to it Mm -hmm. um where there's a strong sense of community and a lot of regulars still but i mean there's just so many restaurants there and so many chefs and um there's all this group of people that are just like i'm going somewhere new i'm going somewhere new instead of like becoming a regular you know um which is challenging for there because like once you open up your spot like first couple years like you're the new restaurant in town and everyone wants to like cycle through it and then afterwards you know every year there's like all these other restaurants open up everyone wants to get over there so it's uh yeah it's a challenging spot yeah imagine yeah so you okay so we get through this time period where you're doing takeout food you then are able to open up the outdoor seating and people are then able to bond with the physical experience of what you described oh yeah it's not you're not they're not quite inside. inside yeah but like, yeah, they get to at least eat the food like hot right yep. then. Have they have know? part of it. So you're like yeah. halfway there, right? Yeah, halfway there. So you're like, ah oh my God, it's so so yeah. close to getting them full, all the way to the full experience. Yeah. And then we hit this point where, you know, you're starting to get more data and information. Like, where are yeah. these people finding you? Like as you're like, was it all through the social the social media Fridays? I think I mean I don't know. Everyone keeps telling me they're like Bellingham is like such a word of mouth town. Yeah. Like the word of mouth is just like spreading and like everyone's leaving with good experience and they're chatting about it. And, you know, um, you know, and this, I think that, and then, yeah, there, there's a couple like different write-ups like in like the, the Bellingham Herald and, um, you know, a couple other little blog posts and stuff like that. But, yeah, I remember when my, my wife had the margarita pizza and she added pepperoni to it. Yeah. And she was like, oh, like just she was telling everybody. It was so oh, it's yeah. just one of those things that I see that word of mouth. Yeah. And um, it's a lot of positive word of mouth in Bellingham. I haven't yeah. I haven't seen as much like of the critic side in Bellingham as I've seen in other areas like a Seattle yeah. or San Francisco or whatever. Yeah, people um, are very, very positive. And like if someone does have a bad experience, like they'll they'll reach out to me like through email, yep. you know, instead of like, Oh, let me just go like straight to Yelp and just like bash your restaurant yeah. because something happened. It's like, yeah, restaurants are going to make mistakes here and there. You know, it's like, yeah. that's just my life, pasta you know? fell on my lap and stained my pants. You're like, <laughs> Oh shoot. I feel <laughs> yeah. so bad for you. Don't come again, but yeah. come again. Yeah. Well, then it's like, yeah. we'll give just, you a bib next time. Uh, but yeah, if they just like email me and say like, Hey, this happened or whatever. And then it's like, of course we're going to make it right. You know, like, you know, whatever happened, like we'll figure it out and fix it. And then they're happy and it's a, it's a win-win. Yeah. Yeah. So we've talked a little bit about the, the chef side, the artist side, yeah. but then there's another side of your brain. That's the business side. Yeah. And for those of us, all of us that yeah. we love eating, we love food, yeah. we love what you cook. Yeah. What does like what is what is the structure of Storia Cucina, uh, like the team in, in in the kitchen, the bartenders, yeah. the yeah. you know the people that are the lifestyle photographers or market? Like how did you how did you place priority and importance on when to hire these people and what positions are important to make it a successful experience? Um. I think uh, just kind of like naturally as the business was growing, um, mm. you, I, I think just over time you can just tell like, okay, now we're selling this amount of stuff. Like we need, you know, we can't keep up with prep with this. We need another person or now we need another line cook. You know, it's about time. And I think with me just, you know, looking at the numbers all the time, like in San Francisco and, 
you just kind of you just know what things cost at this point like what labor should be mm-hmm. you know all those little things so you just keep an eye on that and every month you know you're doing inventory and you know going going over all your like really close look at all the the little details of you know your PL and everything and you can just tell you know if you do make a mistake in something like okay you can correct it very yeah. very quickly that's how much this mistake costs or... yeah where i think some people might just kind of wing it you know and like maybe they're not putting like that much details into tracking their labor costs and mm-hmm. their food and beverage costs and all that kind of those details i think are very important to keep an eye on and there's things you especially know especially in a time like that where it's like oh this is tighter a, yeah this is like an unfamiliar restaurant situation yeah you know absolutely yeah well and you and maybe it enlighten me a little bit so you've got positions that are like a little bit more roi right you've got an increase in demand for mm-hmm. food yeah and then you have you're doing bit you have more busy nights mm-hmm. and then you have to increase the amount of you know good chefs or line cooks or yeah and then there's stuff that's a little bit more like return on impact it's not necessarily like if you hire a good chef they can make more food and they can satisfy the the demand but you've got these like like the lifestyle branding and these kind of ancillary stuff that are super important but they're not like a direct return on investment right yeah how do you like how did you tell me a little bit more about the process we're going like we need to like get someone the pro to market this to to make it to yeah, convey so- the brand Honestly, um, you know, um, you like something that I've learned over time is like using a lot of the like, connections that you have, um, you know, through friends and family and stuff, especially in restaurants where, you know, the startup can be, you know, very expensive, you know. Um, so when I was in San Francisco, I started doing pottery as like a hobby of mine. And I was, you know, I'd make stuff for my restaurant there. And I was making a bunch of stuff for Story Cucina, like all these espresso cups and cappuccino cups. And I was in the pottery studio and I was uh, talking to my teacher uh, and telling her like, yeah, I want to do this mural in the restaurant. And uh, could we have like 18 foot tall ceilings, this huge wall, like something. I want like a beautiful piece of art there. And she's like, yeah, who's going to do it? And then she ended up doing it. Cause it just like, like yeah. snowballed from yeah. there. Yeah. And she had like a marketing and design background. So um, we started doing like food trades where I would uh, feed her at my restaurant there, like do like, uh, I did a special like pasta class for her whole That's team, awesome. yeah. her whole pottery team and stuff. So we started doing like some different trades and, I would do like uh, some specialty pop-up dinners in her ceramic studio where it was like all plated on ceramic ware. And then, you know, people would like buy a ticket and I came and cooked for the, so um, yeah. So I, so I found, you know, someone in had a marketing and design background that I was able to do some food trade with. And, you know, obviously it was like stuff, sometimes stuff just kind of like, falls in your lap, you know, like that when yep. you like put it out there to the universe and you're just like, boom, there's that person, you know, that I was, I needed someone for this, you know? Yep. And so then I, you know, work closely with her on, you know, what, what design, you know, I was looking for. Mm-hmm. And obviously like she brought like a, a ton to the table and would, you know, mock up like different logos and this, mm-hmm. this, and this. And then I'd be like, you know, this mm-hmm. one or a little more of this. And then, you know, we worked together and it, yeah, it all came together. Just, just kept coming yeah. together. And yeah. So she like built out my website for me, did the mural. Um, so a lot of that branding, that initial branding package, um, she helped build for me, you know? Yeah. Well, so. And how important is brand? I mean, if you've got, let's say you've got two, uh, story, quality businesses, how important is the perception beyond oh, just so, the food? Yeah. Yeah. I think, it just goes back to like all those little details, like really mattering, you know, like the branding is one of them. And especially when you're, you're opening up in the pandemic with just to go food and all people really are seeing is kind of the branding in the beginning. 
yep. you know, they're not really getting to come into the space. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So you're, you know, over, you just had your year anniversary. And was it like three months ago, four months ago? Yeah. And May. Yeah. May was our. Is one. May already that long ago? Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah, this year's flying by. Yeah. <laughs> but I remember we were actually my wife and I were actually there, not knowing it was the year anniversary, but we just happened yeah. to be there. Oh yeah. And thinking it's only been a year. I know. Does it feel like a 10 year year? Oh yeah. Yeah. It's like, just like a I marathon. just went back to San Francisco for the first time for a friend of mine's wedding. And I that was the first time I've been back since. And I'm like, I'm there. I'm just like kind of going down like memory lane and it just feels like a whole another lifetime ago yeah but it was like not that long ago but you know yeah and it's it's interesting because and this is coming from a less educated perspective but yeah from what i understand it takes three four five longer years to get a business up and running and and, and working oh yeah and and you know if you look at that timeline and how fast storia has yeah has grown and exploded and just become this kind of the staple, right? And staples are usually, the word is usually associated with somebody that's been there for a while. Yeah. You've only been there for a year and some change. Yeah. How, how did you ramp it up that quick? How, like what, what happened <laughs> to cut that five year, three year timeline into one year? Uh, you know, I, I'm not sure. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I think, uh, yeah, I don't know. I think it just like, you know, doing something with passion and love and um, it, you know, all that kind of stuff just like spreads to the team and the guests and, you know, the farmer, everything, it just all comes together. It's focusing on quality. Yeah. So you had this, another crazy idea. Yeah. Some would say, right. Yeah. You said, you know what? We're in the middle of the pandemic or yeah. kind of in some weird limbo zone at yeah. the end of the middle of the start of the end of the pandemic. And you're like, you know what? I'm going to yeah. start another restaurant style business. Yeah. <laughs> and it's going to be this complimentary vision. Like, tell me about the yeah. vision for Bar Chikati. So, yeah. So Bar Chikati came about. And honestly, I wasn't like hunting for like another restaurant space or, you know, I was Storia just became full capacity in July. Um, so, I mean, we we haven't had like even like a year of full capacity, you know, yet. Um, and the, so Brandon, Brandon Shannon, the old owners of Kismet cafe that's connected to the museum. That's now bar Chikati. They came to me and were like, look, like we want to let go of this place. Like we're having twin girls and life. Yeah. So it was like, we're, we're, we're done with this and we would hate to see it. Um, go to someone that like didn't do something great with it because we love the space and you know have this personal connection to it and we want to see it go to someone good so they're like you know we're getting off our lease i want to introduce you to the museum you guys have a conversation yep. and maybe you can take it over you know there's not a full kitchen there but you could kind of cross utilize your kitchen from storia and you know possibly do some fun here so that's when kind of you know, the wheels started turning and the wheels don't stop turning with you, do they? No, they just they keep don't. going. You're like, they're always going. Well, that was a crazy year. Yeah. All right. Wake let's up in the middle of the night. I'm staring at the ceiling. Like pastas on coming. the swirling on the ceiling. And it's, <laughs> is that the reoccurring nightmare for you or good, good dream? Uh, Meatballs there's... cooked improperly. <laughs> yeah. That and many other things. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, the space is so cool and we, we actually, went there when yeah. it was still nice out yeah and that space in the courtyard and i remembered it from going to kismet um is so it's not even doesn't feel like bellingham no yeah it's, it's so it, so bizarre yeah it's like a beautiful little secluded courtyard back there and um yeah the space was already you know pretty much built out and you know the courtyard was great it's like same street as storia and that's why i agreed to take over the space you know if if it would have been like oh here's this restaurant space it's gonna be a full build out and do this i had been like absolutely not <laughs> definitely <Yeah. Nope. laughs> and yeah just the fact that it was gonna um complement storia um was the reason why i was into it and that you know we're more cocktail focused 
at Storia Cucina. And yeah, we have like some great Italian wines there, but we don't have like a full on list mm -hmm. and we don't necessarily really have the space for it either. And so then I was like, you know, here's my opportunity to put together a great wine program, which I also thought was needed in a good addition to Bellingham, mm -hmm. you know? So yeah, for me, like opening a restaurant, like all those little details have to make sense. Like I don't want to open it just for just because for a business, like just to get a business going and open it, like it's got to make sense. The space has got to be right. Um, all those little details, like the neighbors, the street it's on, like um, it feels good to be on Grand Avenue where it's kind of just this random street in Bellingham, but not too far from everything, yeah. but it needed a little bit of love. So now like, you know, with like Story Cucina there and Bar Chicago, it's kind of like, help bringing life to something that um, that was needed, you know, yeah. and there's a million breweries in town and there's not enough like good wine. And I think, um, you know, breweries are great and we all love beer, but um, I think there's a certain amount of people that appreciate good wine too. And um, yeah, that's kind of where I was like, okay, this is the opportunity to do a good wine program. And then the same thing with the coffee, um, the Italian style coffee is like, yeah, there's other coffee shops, but no one's doing just like traditional Italian coffee or Cafe Umbria mm -hmm. coffee roaster, mm -hmm. um, which they're, you know, based in Seattle, but we get their beans from them. And like, we're, we're the only ones like serving, um, Cafe Umbria beans and everyone was loving the coffee at Story Cucina. And they're like, oh, man, I wish you'd open earlier so you get, like, you know, some nice wheels go. start turning. You're like, yeah. uh oh, they're doing it. I, I can't <laughs> stop them again. So that's where I was like, okay, I can kind of tie it into, like, the Story Cucina package, like, kind of, like, same branding um, and just this little, like, off, you know, sister coffee wine bar spot that's right there and make it work, you know, and, like, cross-utilize the staff and the team and, the kitchen so you have and, people that work at both and they kind of go back and forth when they're yeah. needed at each spot yeah and um, very nice yeah so we have like some of the cooks that work at both and some people in the front so it's like the same uh style of pos so if you if you're like a server at storia you know you can easily like jump in at archicotti or vice versa it's like the same kind of training goes into it like different menu items but um you know same style of hospitality and um same quality of food and ingredients mm -hmm. um just different dishes yeah yeah you're talking about italian coffee and there's there's a lot of good coffee shops in town yeah but i've never heard of one of them referred to as italian style coffee for yeah. for the for the person that's drinking motor oil black coffee what like yeah. what is that <laughs> italian style coffee and what's that experience like? honestly it's just like it's just simple and straightforward you know there's not like a million different kinds of coffee or all these different sizes and syrups or none of that stuff it's like there's like espresso yeah cappuccino latte mocha like that's pretty much it yeah you know what i mean there's a cut like americano there's a couple of those basic ones and they're just more like the traditional size like you can't go to bar Chicotti and get a 16 ounce cappuccino just doesn't exist or a 24 you know? ounce uh, white chocolate breve or no. something yeah. <laughs> it's a real drink by the way <laughs> that's a story for another time it's yeah. i almost died yeah yeah so that's part of the experience and then the complimentary aspect so somebody's let's say like we're going out my wife and i are going on date night yeah you know you get, you get your name on the list it's super busy at yeah. storia but it's a good place yeah. where you could pop over across the street yeah. kitty corner get wine apps exactly yeah yeah, so now, like, when we do get really busy, you know, like, on Friday or Saturday or um, any other days, uh, you know, there's a wait. We're just like, hey, go to our sister restaurant. It's literally right there. We can point to it yeah. and go have, like, a nice glass of wine, um, you know. Uh, you know, Get amped spread, up on it, some espresso you know, or something. Yeah, or yeah, whatever you want, like, a little bit of charcuterie or something, and uh, we'll text you when your table's ready. So now all of a sudden it's like, you know, turning their dining experience over here. So it's like, oh, we get to like pop over here, have a nice glass of wine, a little snack. Then we're going to come over here and then the like dining continue experience. It, yeah. You know, so it's, I mean, 
I love doing that when I go out to eat anyways, is like not just like eat all at one spot. It's like, hey, let me go over here and mm-hmm. then like pop over here for a drink or here for dessert. Like it's kind of fun to bounce around a little bit, yep. you know, instead of just like one spot, you know. Absolutely. Same, yeah. same vibe, same type of experience, different spot. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. And now instead of like, oh, let me just like wait outside until my table's ready. Like, oh, just go over there and have a glass of wine. You yeah, know? We, we need it. We need our pasta and we need it now. We need our yeah, wine yeah. and we need it now, right? Yeah. All right. Here you go. There yeah, you go. There it is. Bar Chicotti right there. Yeah. So now let's flip it to giving a little advice. So yeah. for, you know, the the, the starting entrepreneur yeah. or restaurateur, is that the right word? Restaurant? Rest, I can't even speak. Yeah. I don't even know. Tour. Yeah. Yeah. Don't ask me. <laughs> Ask Jonathan, uh, what, what is your recommendation? Uh, like what, what do you say for someone that's got this, an idea? Um, what, what are like, what, what should they be doing? What should they not be doing? What's the, what's the key? What's the why? I mean, I think if like, you know, anyone is going to like open a restaurant, they should at least go get some like hands-on experience in the restaurant first, you know, like see what it's all about. And it's like, it's pretty much like, paid education like you're getting paid somewhere else to work and like learn all these little systems and stuff and like make sure it's something you really want to do you know if you're just like going into it like oh, i want to open this restaurant and like make all this money and stuff like most likely it's not going to work out you know Um, you have to like really like be in it for the long haul and have you know be able because you know it's there's ups and downs in the industry and you have to jump in there and uh get your elbows dirty and you know get you know dive right in it just yeah so yeah just just like yeah yeah. i think like getting some experience first and making sure it's like really something you want to do yep um or you know hiring like a restaurant consultant um to like that has all that knowledge to to dial it in for you. So, yep. you know, be very passionate about it, be in it for the long haul. Yeah. And you can love to cook and you can cook at home too. Like, Oh yeah, yeah. exactly. It's like some of the best meals are home cooked meals. So it's like, yeah, just because you love cooking at home doesn't mean you want to be in the restaurant industry. It's yeah. completely different. <laughs> it's just yeah. like, you well, might hate cooking after that. <laughs> yeah. It's very different. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Well, Thank you so much for yeah. joining us today and telling your story. Um, we've all been big fans and Thank excited you. to see you continue to, to yeah. grow and and really set the bar in a lot of ways for the local restaurant scene. And um, there's a lot of good local restaurants, but I mean, you guys are at the top. I mean, I, I just you. love seeing it. Love yeah, seeing success. it feels good to be a part of the community and slowly get to know like, you know, the different restaurant owners and different business owners and just the different people here, all the regulars and um, get to know them a little bit more and build that community and um, yeah, be a part of it. It feels good. Well, thanks for all that you do for, for food in Bellingham and for local businesses and uh, for just the people that need to take a break from their busy lives and come in and have a great experience. Yeah. Happy. Happy You're the man. Happy to be here. <laughs>